removing nudes with both the law and the cyber and wrap up with how to uh, look like you're DJing. So I'll hand it off to our first speakers. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello. internet. <laughs> uh, I'm Aaron. I'm Farah. And we are from the Labak Collective. Um, we are going to give this presentation um, about removing nudes with law and cyber. And then we will talk about uh, DJ PsyOps <laughs> and perception management in the club scene. Um, before we get started, um, we want to provide a content warning. We are talking about uh, what's colloquially known as revenge porn. We also deal a lot with cybersexual abuse and harassment in this space. Um, we are not going to be offended if you need to mute, take a step away. Um, some of these topics are very hard, but we take it upon ourselves to, to talk about it uh, when we can. But we bear in mind that everyone needs a content warning for this. Um, a little bit about us. So I um, am a computer engineer, and I also specialize in cybersecurity policy. Uh, I'm, I've also founded a organization called Decrypted. So what we do is provide accessible educational resources with regard to cybersecurity. And I'm Aaron, pronouns they, them. I enjoy working as a security researcher, um, trust and safety researcher. Um, I started Labak with uh, a cohort of mine a couple years ago, and ever since then we've added more to it. So, uh, what is Labak? Um, fun fact: it's cabal backwards. We've never actually publicly acknowledged that, um, but it's uh, mostly a hacker collective with a bunch of people from other groups. Um, what we wanted to do when we initially started it was unite um, folks who were thinking about tech criticism, folks who were in the cyber sexual abuse uh, space and just share resources, get people in the same um, like chats so that we could uh, talk about what we're doing separately and share resources that we may wanna deploy across different segments. Um, so you may know some of these groups like Cyper, Decrypted, um, Tech Against Fascism. Um, we are also members of the New York Cyber Sexual Abuse Task Force. Um, hello to those watching. Um, that is a you know, joint task force in New York full of really awesome people uh, who work in the cyber sexual abuse space um, fighting for survivors. Uh, we also are the curators of the Museum of Modern Malware at DEF CON. Um, I know it's been a while since the last IRL DEF CON, but it was cool and it was fun and I'm excited to do it one day again. Uh, and um, you can contact us at labak.dev, at labak.dev on Twitter. Um, you know, we, we, we look forward to every message that we get there. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Decrypted, which is a new organization. Um, so we provide accessible educational security resources completely free of charge. Um, so this is really targeted toward people who don't feel like they're included in conversations regarding cybersecurity. Um, so in 2021, cybersecurity is really a basic life skill at this point. Um, it is, a key part of uh, cyber self-defense. And there are a few just hacks that everybody could use. Uh, we're also a member organization of LABAC. And with that, we're also members of the New York Cyber Sexual Abuse Task Force. So our largest platform at the moment is Instagram, just to reach everybody. So if you are interested in what we do, you can reach us at decrypted.tech or on Instagram, we're also decrypted.tech. All right, so now we're gonna get into something that is very uh, important, but not always practiced. So we're gonna talk about sending nudes safely. 
So one of the basic things when you're sending some anything safely is to use an encrypted channel rather than uh, just one side encryption, which is called encryption in transit, which is when you have your message from the sender going to the server that processes something. And at that time, it's jumbled up and encrypted. At the server level, it's then decrypted with a key and then they are able to read it and then it goes to the final recipient. So what needs to happen when you're sending sensitive information is using end-to-end -end decryption. So one of the softwares that we recommend is ProtonMail um, and also another one that we're going to get into is Signal. You always want to use open source software if you can, that way you know that the claims that are being made are true. All right, so Signal, this is a great app that gained a lot of popularity in 2020. Um, one of the huge benefits is the default end-to-end -end encryption. So this is not something that you see in a lot of apps. For example, Telegram, you need to take the steps to make it end-to-end -end encrypted. Also, end-to-end -end encryption is not available for group chats, whereas for Signal, it is also with phone calls and uh, video chats. So this also minimizes the information associated with your identity. The only thing that you need to sign up for Signal is a phone number. Um, you can use your own phone number or you can mask it by using something like Google Voice. Uh, as you can see in the little diagram we have below, there's minimal information attached to you with Signal. And then with WhatsApp, you start getting some more data that's linked to you. So location, contacts, then you get into Facebook. Facebook owns everything. So that's where they get into your biometric data, health and fitness data. Um, and then we have some other parts that just make it easy to use, like a built-in blur tool. Really what we're hammering in here is if something's easy to use, people will use it. Um, and you don't need to have a very complicated way of sending something securely. All right, so now another thing to keep yourself safe is some photo manipulation. Uh, this can be for anonymity or it can be for later identification. So this is something that comes into play when we're talking about sensitive topics like revenge porn. So one of the first things that unfortunately not a ton of people know about is EXIF data. So when you take an image, it's not just what meets the eye. There is an associated file with over 50 tags on it. Some of the things that are there are extremely sensitive identifiers. So if you're able to open the EXIF data, you are often going to see a location if the, fo if the photo was taken with a smartphone. Um, so it gives exact coordinates along with the date and time that it was taken and then other things like the camera information. It also allows the user to edit the copyright information. Um, later, we're going to be talking about DMCA and where copyright comes into play. So uh, this is going to sound really simple because I know this is like a major part of a lot of apps, but um, a lot of people just don't turn disappearing messages on, uh, even though we all go to these apps that have it as like a somewhat standard feature. Um, so just your general reminder, I don't know who needs to hear it, but this is a feature that you need to turn on yourself. Um, it doesn't need to be for 30 minutes. It could be for a week. Um, actually, most of mine are, are for a week because we are talking about memes. Um, but you know, there's, there's actually a lot of people I know who, who don't actually turn on the disappearing messages in Signal. Um, basically, every app Messenger has it now. Um, and a lot of them even have anti-screenshot protection as well. Um, so these are all settings that, unfortunately, are not on by default, but they are there. Go and find them. Um, they're very useful. 
Um, a little bit about watermarking. So um, remember, we aren't just scrubbing ex exif data so that we could uh, care about privacy, but sometimes we actually want to add things and that's for later identification. A uh, big one is watermarking. Uh, watermarking your nudes, great idea. Um, it helps us prove later that those nudes are in fact yours. Um, why would we want to do that? Well, in a copyright scenario, uh, a watermark will actually help us prove that you are the copyright owner for that material. Um, what's great about a platform like OnlyFans, which we are a member of, um, you can actually upload anything to OnlyFans and it will put the watermark right in the corner. A very simple way to prove that it originated from your account. Um, by the way, quick shout out on our OnlyFans. Um, we find that it's a great and easy way to get us on your case. So if you're an OnlyFans user, you can essentially message us, say, I give you the legal right to you know, go find my nudes on the internet. And that will actually be permissible from a DMCA standpoint, which is awesome, which is why we're there, which is why we're helping people out there. Um, it's a very simple way about doing it. Um, uh, we have a quick demo of how some of this might work, uh, Farah. Yes. OK, so um, we're just going to put together a situation where this might need to come into play. Um, so very uh, intimate situation <laughs> where two, might, two people might be talking. One thing that always needs to be there is consent and boundaries. Um, regardless of the platform, this needs to be spoken about. It doesn't need to be a long thing, um, but it is important. So we don't want to be using something like iMessage um, because this will attach a lot of things to your identity. Um, so we want to move this to an encrypted channel like Signal. So before moving to Signal, we're going to use something called EXIF metadata. So this allows us to scrub the metadata. As you can see, one of the things is you can see the location that the photo was taken, and you can just remove all of that uh, with a key click. And then we're going to move to Signal. And here we have the encrypted channel. And one thing that we're going to turn on is disappearing messages. Um, so let's say you want to leave it for 30, 30 minutes. So before sending the picture, this is uh, a matter of personal taste. If you would like to remove or blur your face, Signal has that built in, and then you're able to send it. And again, safety does not have to be a long, drawn out process. You can see that this took about a minute to do. We are going to wrap up with a little bit about taking down content. Um, this next part, real quick, I'm just going to say uh, the thing we talk about a lot is are we giving tools and techniques to the enemy? And um, a big part about what Labak does is we see ourselves as having all this cybersecurity knowledge, hacking knowledge, whatever. Um, and we want to diffuse that, give that to people who could use those skills, but don't have them because they don't work in cyber. So that's people like survivors of abuse, sex workers. But we talk a lot about in the security community and we talk a lot about in the cyber sexual abuse space uh, about whether we are giving tools to abusers. Um, and I'll just say right now, if we ever catch you doing that, you know, you, you'll, you'll make a lot of enemies. Uh, but I know that is not going to stop everybody. Um, finding this content is very useful if you're looking for your nudes. Um, it's also very useful if you're trying to find them. And I'm going to be patently aware of that by not talking in detail. Um, one thing about OnlyFans um, and why we're often requested by OnlyFans users to go find their misused content 
um, is because there's a lot of people who don't want to pay for that content. One of the first places they go to are Reddit, followed by Discord, Telegram, Twitter. Um, it's not impossible to find these. Um, in fact, most Reddit, uh, most Reddit uh, content misuse cases we see on the OnlyFans side, um, they will pay, typically put the OnlyFans username as the subreddit. Um, one thing that we essentially do when asked is we'll go to Reddit, act on behalf of the OnlyFans user, and say, this subreddit is full of misused content. Here's the originals. Here's the uh, the uh, infringing work. Um, and Reddit will take it down, no problem, no sweat. Um, another thing for the other platforms is just doing a Google dork, um, double quotations around the username. You'll find it eventually. Um, further research, um, this is, <laughs> there's an awesome, awesome article. I suggest everyone to put in their browser and Google it, but we're not gonna talk it too much. Um, you could take image fingerprint hashes and essentially create a database um, of wherever things are being posted. Um, one long-term project that we are working on is essentially using forum scrapers that we've used for the darknet but use it on forums where they post, uh, you know, non-voluntary -volu sexual imagery. Uh, we end up with a database full of image hashes, um, and that's something that we can reference later when someone wants to know if any of their content's been leaked there. Um, really, really brief thing on the DMCA. Um, it's a law that does a lot of things, <laughs> um, but for the most part, we're gonna use it as a tool to uh, make sure that copyright isn't being infringed. Um, some websites have a very easy form to use this. Otherwise, you have to actually send it in um, to whatever email address or contact info that site might have. Um, if they are operating in the US and they have user-generated gener content being uploaded, then they have to have participation in this. There will be some sort of contact info. Um, if you want the full story, um, you could go to our website, labak.dev slash content. We have links to all the major social media platforms, content takedown sites, as well as a DMCA template that you're free to use that works in the past. Um, very, very quickly, um, first you draft the letter in the exact format that is required by law. Um, you send this to the websites either via that contact form or the dedicated emails that they have set up and you await any follow-ups. Um, sometimes they won't even notify you if the content's been removed. So just be sure to keep on checking. Um, but this is this is like our, our bread and butter. Um, this wasn't like a very commonly used tactic, maybe even like a couple of years ago. Um, I'm very happy that more people are using this. They're watermarking their nudes. They are copywriting them in some cases and going after all the content misuse that they find themselves. Um, it's very um, simple to do as long as you follow everything to a T. Um, unfortunately, because of the uh, you know the the kind of obtuse like legal understanding that is required that might be a little intimidating. Just contact us, ask for help if you ever need it, um, or contact anybody else in this space and um, we'll make sure that you know, we, we could do the best that we can. Um, okay. All right, we're gonna pivot to the second part of the presentation. Um, this is <laughs> about being a fake DJ, uh, this is based on experience. Uh, I, I know it may not work for everybody, but um, let me let me begin by talking a little bit about what psyops are. Um, if you work in the cybersecurity space, especially in a very particular part of the cybersecurity space, um, you may have run into this. Um, the idea is that people have perceptions that can be played with, manipulated, um, and you, you hear a lot about this in the social engineering part of the hacking community. Um, PSYOPs are typically uh, outside of the military context. They're, they're, they're broadened social engineering campaigns across a wide variety of people. Um, so, a little bit about DJing. Well, so 
there's a classic look of what a DJ looks like. A lot of times they have a turntables with vinyl records. Um, that's a little old school, but the concept is the same. Um, you have two musical inputs, two input sources, and you are managing between the two. Um, the concept is the same regardless if you're using a CDJ, which is the most popular digital one today, or you're DJing with vinyl records. Um, you're you're going to basically have the same setup. This is what that setup looks like today with a digital uh, interface. Um, but since we're learning how to fake DJ, this is a little uh, irrelevant. But you can see how on the left we have an audio source, on the right we have an audio source. You're queuing up a playlist below and you're managing what the audience is hearing between the two. Um, this is going to be important when uh, we are spinning up perception, not discs. Here's the plan. We're going to design an aesthetic and brand for your DJ alter ego. Uh, we're going to come up with a playlist. Doesn't need to be that crazy. Um, and uh, we're going to book a gig at a non-suspecting bar, club, or party. Um, here's how you're going to do that. You're either going to call ahead and say you're your manager, booking for the last leg of a tour sounds they aren't going to question it um or you're just going to walk in on a random night and claim to be the dj for that night now this relies on a unsuspecting or apathetic staff we'll get into that later um four you actually need to do the gig and then five profit a lot of these gigs typically pay in cash or in drinks um so here are some five tips on how this works. Um, most important one, confident body movement. You gotta be bopping, you gotta be dancing, the occasional fist bumping. If you have your homies there, you're gonna wanna like have them like whisper in your ear. You know, you, you kind of, yeah, 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 you talk, but you gotta be smiling. You gotta be like looking like you're having a blast. You gotta know what you're doing when it comes to the hand movements. Um, like I said, we don't need to know how to DJ, but you need to at least look like you're doing something. It could, uh, uh, I've actually coded and done work while DJing um, and it gets the job done. Programming has a lot of tip taps, it's fine. Um, the next one is astroturfing. This is important. Remember, we've established a brand and aesthetic. Um, I, hopefully you have a DJ name. Uh, Farrah, what's your DJ name? <laughs> uh, we know, I, yeah. <laughs> decline to state. Um, but, uh, you, you know, hope, <laughs> uh, but hopefully, hopefully you have your Instagram set up. That's important. Um, Instagram is currency and the number of followers that you have will determine the uh, appreciation of that that currency. So um, you're just going to want to acquire fake followers. That's that's what you're going to want to do. Um, you can get them for pretty cheap. Um, you can usually get uh, bulk packages of 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. Um, another thing you need to think about with this, not like I'm some OPSEC expert, <laughs> obviously, but you are going to want to buy likes as well. Um, the, sus the suspecting viewer of your Instagram will be able to see that you have a high follower count, but not a high number of likes on your posts. That's a red flag. So you're going to want to budget for the number of likes and followers you're going to need. And you don't need a bunch. I'd suggest 10,000 followers and then you know a couple thousand likes across several posts. Um, but remember, everything you post needs to be part of the aesthetic. Um, another way you could hack that is if you post stories, you don't need to necessarily buy likes on stories. Um, targeting. All right. Very important. You're gonna want you're gonna want to find a venue with ideally these four things. It's known for DJs or open mic sets. Um, it's in a low key yet artsy area. Um, DJ Mail Fraud's career was all in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, unassuming, apathetic staff. That's they're your friends, um, and they're the ones who are essentially going to go along with your grift. And known for cheap drinks, um, booze is important. Um, 
the more alcohol is in circulation in the bar, uh, the better you will sound. And that is not a you problem. That is a everybody else problem. Um, so yeah, this is a venue. I'm not gonna state which one. You could see the DEF CON hat. That's how you know I was there. Um, aesthetic. Um, so we talked a little bit about this. You need a DJ name. You need an aesthetic. Um, you need a really cool poster. You need to dress cool. Um, that's my attempt. Um, but you essentially need to look cool. You need to look like what you think a DJ might look like. And that will uh, go a long way. No one's going to question it when you're the coolest person in the room and you're carrying a computer and saying you're the DJ. Um, people will just go along with it. And lastly, you're going to need a tiny bit of musical know-how. Um, so I know that this is about being a fake DJ, but you're going to need bare minimum these skills. You're going to need to be able to put together a playlist. I actually recommend putting together like three playlists, um, one sorted by ambient, poppy, hard, which will be anything from like rock, punk um, to like hardcore techno. And then uh, Latin. I have an entire thing of Latin. Um, that's that's important. Uh, don't don't skip on the bad buddy. Um, you're also gonna want either a cheap DJ software or literally just Spotify. Um, Spotify has a crossfade option in the advanced settings. You can go an entire set using that as long as you have the playlist queued up exactly the order that you want to. Uh, what they call in the industry selection. Um, you can get pretty far with Spotify's automatic crossfade option. So, so don't think that you need any sort of like new software to do this. You don't. You just need to be the selector and to use the crossfade option. Um, the most important aspect for transitioning between songs, whether you're doing it manually or with relying on Spotify's algorithm, um, you're going to want to keep beat matching in mind, um, even when you're not doing this manually. Um, so beat matching, the concept is you want to transition from song to song where both songs have a similar tempo, or at least they have a tempo close enough that when you transition over, um, whether it's sped up a little or sped down a little, um, it's going to want to seem as seamless as possible when it comes to the beat. You can't go from a slow song to a peppy song without a little bit of jarring from the audience perspective. Um, so there are plenty of sites and softwares that do this, um, depending on the DJ software. Again, I recommend DJ Pro. It's free, right? I think. Um, they will actually do it for you automatically. Uh, or you could go to a website like songbpub.com, just type in the song um, and it will give you the key, it will give you the BPM and you can start uh, planning your playlist accordingly based off of what the BPM is. So again, a little bit of musical know-how, know -how, but you can go a pretty long way uh, faking it. Uh, and the outcomes are fun. I mean, you get to be a DJ, essentially, um, and you get to play a, a, a gig, <laughs> which is um, hilarious. Uh, and really, you get free drinks, which is uh, frankly half of why I did it. Um, so yeah, being a fake DJ, the secrets of DJing uh, kind of spilled there. I mean, uh, they all look like they're very busy. They're not. They're, they're not. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we'd be happy to turn it over to our moderator. I actually don't know if we're going. Are, are we doing a Q&A? Um, yeah, we've got time for a Q&A if you guys want it. Fantastic. Um, yeah. how, much, how much time? Uh, we have about 10. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, yeah, let's do that. Um, our, would we just take that from Slack? Yeah. Fantastic. I don't see any questions in there just yet, but if anybody wants to ask up, then we can go from there. We had some minor technical issues that we were working through during your talk, but everything looks to be good now. So folks may be just catching up. Awesome. All right. So 
our first question. Yeah, you can see that one. Uh, what's up with the GRU flag, and where'd you get it? Oh, what that? <laughs> That's nothing. Um, I got it from the internet, uh, where most people get most things. <laughs> nothing to see here. <laughs> How do you find songs for your playlist? Um, well, I'm maybe I'm being assumptuous, but I hope you have music taste. Um, and if you do have music taste, then you start thinking about, okay, what are the songs I listen to when I'm happy? What are the songs I listen to when I'm sad? Branch those out into different moods, vibes, different playlists, and you will start to, uh, you know, get the ball rolling thinking about other songs that you like that are similar. If you have something like Spotify, again, the algorithm is everywhere. They will continue to recommend songs based off of what you've added to a playlist. Um, that's also good for selection. Um, but, you know, I get most of my music from suggestions from friends, suggestions from algorithms like YouTube and Spotify. Um, it's, it's, it's easy once you have a couple to get the momentum from all that recommendation and, and get some more on there. Um, how do you delete EXIF data through your phones, native at photo apps, or do you need a third party to do that? Um, yeah, um, Farrah, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I think that was, I don't know which app that was. I forget off the top of my head. Sure. Um, so you can't do it on any phone's native app. You can only view the EXIF data. However, if you're using Apple, you can use EXIF meta metadata, or if you're using Android, you can use EXIF editor. So these are free apps really easy to use. Is that for Android and iOS? So EXIF metadata for iOS and then EXIF editor for Android. Cool. Oh, and there will be a recording. Awesome. Can you touch more on how anti-screenshot tech works? Um, so it's fairly new. Um, both iOS and Android have native SDKs in the operating system for developers to use. So it's not something that you can implement on your phone so that it works on every single app. It will vary from application to application. Perfect example is most of the banking apps have this now. You can't take a screenshot of your account if you're in the JP Morgan Chase app, for instance, and that works on Android and iOS. Um, so it will depend from app to app to app. Um, the way that you turn it on in something like Signal is you have to go to the advanced settings um, and it will stop screenshots. Um, it's it simple as that. But again, it relies on the developers of the app to implement it. It's not something that you could turn on across the entire uh, phone operating system. Um, oh, and there's more above. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so do you have a recommendation on how many transitions you need to have an up tempo versus more down tempo in a given time? If I have an hour long set, should I peak once or twice an hour, more or less? Um, yeah, uh, I, I think you mean like peak, like in terms of tempo. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't necessarily have a suggestion there. I think um, one thing about being a fake DJ is you have more, uh, more capacity to monitor the crowd and read the room. And frankly, that's more important than any sort of musical skill. Um, if people are feeling the music, then great. You should just continue on whatever you're doing. Um, don't try and force cocktail twins when everyone's like bopping to uh, JLo. So, um, you know, there's, you gotta be cognizant, you know, again, you're a social engineer, you are a psychological operator, you want to read people, read the room, get a sense of what the vibe is and exploit that. Um, you could have 10 peaks for all I care if everybody's loving it. Um, so, so no recommendation there other than uh, be cognizant of your environment. Um, let me look a little, I, I think, Leslie said that there are some talks or some questions. Let me just see if I missed any. I think we've caught up on all of them. We've got one last one about XDIF data and the parlor hack, and then we'll uh, wrap up from there. Okay. Um, we don't have to answer that. It's Peter. <laughs> <laughs> 
Peter, Peter, Peter is our paid stooge um, <laughs> to to give us questions um, in this chat. Um, but I, I hear Exif data helped with the uh, uh, it helped with people analyzing people um, who were involved in the insurrection. Uh, I've heard about that, but you know, who knows? It's for a different talk. All right. Well, thanks for coming by.